This is Nyavaran Palace in North Tehran, former residence of Muhammad Reza Pahlavi, the Shah of Iran. It was from here that in January 1979, the Shah left to go into exile, never to return. Two weeks later, Ayatollah Khomeini proclaimed an Islamic Republic and the end of 2,500 years of monarchy in Iran. Today, Niavaran is kept as a museum. In the Shah's dressing room, hang uniforms heavy with ribbons and braid, the classic trappings of the third world dictator. Frozen in time by the events of 1979, this is the Shah's enduring reputation. But the man who wore the uniforms would never accept this label. In his own eyes, he was a visionary king, leading a grateful nation towards something that he called the Great Civilization. History now tells us that he was wrong, but for nearly 40 years, Many people gambled on him being right. This is the story of that gamble and of why Muhammad Reza Pahlavi became the last Shah. There is a very specific and special relationship between me and my people. As long as this special relationship exists between myself and my people, I don't see where somebody should uh, or could step in and, and break it. The Shah was a genuine visionary. He had a vision for his country, um, a fully developed country taking its place alongside its natural Aryan compatriots of Western Europe and the United States. He wasn't just a cynical dictator. Mardom ma shah ro mist ek shaitan midunastan. Hatta kar khubesh ro ham bar asas shaitanat miyaftan, na bar asas inke ye kar khub dare mikone. The Shah became Shah because of his father, Reza Khan, the first Pahlavi Shah. Outside the White Palace in Tehran stands an unfinished statue of Reza Khan. Work on the statue was halted by the revolution, but the bronze legs remain as an unintended monument to a man who came from nowhere to found a dynasty. Reza Khan's rise to power coincided with his country's decline. By the 1900s, Iran, known to foreigners as Persia, had been carved up by the imperial superpowers of Russia and Great Britain. As his country fell apart, Reza Khan began his ascent to the throne. He joined the Iranian Cossack Brigade and rapidly rose through the ranks. After the First World War, he entered the political arena as a military strongman. In 1926, he ousted the ruling Qajar dynasty and crowned himself Reza Shah Pahlavi, King of Kings. At his side during the coronation was his six-year-old son, Mohammad Reza, now crown prince and heir to the throne. Judge for yourself, he later wrote, how much fear and reverence all of that ceremony could inspire in a child of six. Fear and reverence also sum up the feelings inspired in the son by his father. He was this uh, frightened young boy who was always belittled by his father, and Reza Shah always said, my son can't carry on after me. He's not tough enough to do this. He's got to be a ruler like me if he wants to hold this country together. So the boy always felt inadequate in relationship to this giant of a figure. Reza Shah was um, the very pragmatic, uh, level-headed, uh, disciplined, and strong man. Um, his son, Muhammad Reza Shah, was uh, a bit of a mystic, very sentimental, uh, thin-skinned, uh, and uh, really uh, very emotional. 
They were really very, very different uh, personalities. Reza Shah dominated his countrymen as well as his son. Believing Iran had become stuck in the Middle Ages, he applied the disciplines of the parade ground to bring it into the modern world. Taking his inspiration from the West, he built railways and roads and founded hospitals, schools and universities. At the same time, he dealt ruthlessly with enemies and rivals, making the Pahlavi name feared and hated throughout Iran. His most stubborn opponents were to be found among the Iranian clergy. Iran is a Muslim country, but like no other. Nearly all Iranians are Shiites, the minority sect in Islam. Shiism is the repository of the country's most traditional beliefs. It gives to the Iranian psyche Puritanism, a distrust of authority, and a reverence for martyrdom. But Reza Shah had no time for a religion that got in the way of modernization. In a frontal assault on tradition, Reza Shah outlawed the chador, or veil, worn by women, and for good measure he ordered that men shave their beards and adopt the Pahlavi cap. کلاه پهلوی را با میخ میکوبند به سر مردم و خدمتتون از کنم که چادرها را از پیرزنهایی که اصلا نمیتونه بدون هجاب زندگی کنه اینا را از سرشون به زور برداشته میشه سلب آزادی ها میشه و مشخصه عمده رزاخان قلدری بود ایجاد وحشت در دل مردم بود که رمز موفقیتش بود In 1931, Reza Shah sent his 11-year-old son to be educated in the West, at La Rose School on Lake Geneva in Switzerland. Reza Shah said, it is hard for me to part from my beloved son, but Iran needs educated and enlightened rulers. But the beloved son was to suffer more than the father. He was sent to a foreign country with a guardian who was intimidated by Reza Shah into making sure that this boy never got into any trouble, so that the boy was never allowed to do anything. He couldn't ride a bicycle, he wasn't allowed to go off weekends climbing in the mountains in Switzerland. And so he was basically marooned in his room. He had an utterly miserable time. He was a lonely, miserable, isolated young man. On his return to Iran in 1936, the 17-year-old crown prince was ordered to marry Princess Fazia the sister of King Farouk of Egypt. The royal wedding took place in Tehran in March 1939. Among the guests of the celebrations were military attaches from European countries on the brink of war. Reza Shah had intended to keep Iran out of the war, confident that his army would deter any aggressor. But the British and Russians needed to run a supply route through Iran. And so, on the 25th of August, 1941, they invaded from the north and south. There was virtually no resistance. The swift action that occupied a weak country in danger of falling into the grip of Hitler. Expecting to be dethroned, Reza Shah abdicated in favor of his son. He went into exile in South Africa, where he died in 1944. His last message to his son was, never be afraid of anything. With no guarantee that the Allies would approve his succession, the Crown Prince had to move quickly. On the 16th of September 1941, the plainly nervous 21-year-old arrived at the Iranian parliament and swore to reign as a constitutional monarch. Iran had a new king, and no one seemed more surprised than the new Shah himself. He was like a child who is suddenly thrown into a stormy sea and asked uh, to swim. So he had no time to, to think uh, what was happening to him. He was carried by the events. After the war, political life in Iran, stifled for so long under Reza Shah, returned. Nationalists vied with the Communist Two-Day Party for control of the streets, while the country's traditional power blocks, landowners, bazaar merchants, aristocrats and clergy schemed tirelessly to claw back the privileges that Reza Shah had usurped. As a constitutional monarch, the new Shah appeared to play no part in this power struggle. Behind the scenes, however, he was working hard to create a power base for himself. Hoping to mobilize the support of Iran's huge rural population, 
he started to give away the deeds of crowned lands to peasant farmers. These simple ceremonies express the Shah's ideal of kingship, a benevolent ruler giving and a grateful people receiving. In February 1949, an attempt was made on his life. Five bullets were fired from close range. Though wounded, the Shah survived. This near miraculous escape confirmed a conviction he had held since childhood. One of the dominating characteristics of the Shah was his report that he was divinely protected and inspired by visions. He had very serious uh, childhood illnesses and he reports that he was saved from each disease by a vision which came to him at night. The Shah concluded that he was divinely protected and that he was kept on earth in order to fulfill a divine mission. That was a very important part. People didn't take it seriously. He believed it. The Shah's brush with death concentrated minds on the succession. Despite the birth of a baby daughter in 1942, his marriage with Fawzia had not prospered. They had divorced in 1948. It was necessary to find a new wife and produce a male heir. Soraya Esfandiari, half Iranian, half Bavarian, was selected for the role. After the divorce, the Shah was very lonely. Right away, the Shah fell in love with this uh, fine lady. And uh, especially after uh, it was the time which she came to Tehran, and they were engaged, uh, she became ill. And apparently the first time His Majesty went to visit this beautiful lady, he had tears in his eyes coming down. They loved each other very much, I must say. They were married in 1951. By the 1950s, the Shah was still ruling as a constitutional monarch, but was finding the role increasingly restrictive. He was conscious of the contrast with his father, whose body had been returned to Iran in 1950. Throughout his life, the Shah was haunted by this vision of his father, and there were groups that had been excluded from power who would use him. He would come to tell him, but your majesty, this is a monarchy. Remember your father, when your father was there, uh, could the price of bread uh, quadruple in a month? Never. He would go and throw two uh, bakers in their ovens and that would be the end of the story. This comparison uh, was constantly there. But even as the Shah tried to assert himself, a politician appeared who intended to further restrict his powers, Dr. Mossadegh. Jailed by Reza Shah, he now challenged his son over the issue of Iran's oil. Iranian oil had always been a British concession. In return for a percentage of the royalties, the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, in which the British government held a majority share, had exclusive rights to exploit Iran's oil. By the 1950s, nearly 10% of the world's oil came through Anglo-Iranian's refinery at Abadan. Anglo-Iranian made twice as much in profits as Iran did in royalties. Oil nationalization was the issue on which Mossadegh rose to power. Unable to resist the wave of nationalist sentiment, the Shah reluctantly appointed Mossadegh prime minister in 1951. A bill nationalizing the Anglo-Iranian oil company was immediately passed. The British responded by withdrawing from Abadan and imposing a worldwide boycott of Iranian oil. Mossadegh tried to bring Shah, young Shah, into the camp of the nationalist, knowing his resentment to the British and create popularity for him. But Mossadegh wanted a figurehead while the Shah longed to exercise real power. So uh, gradually, in a struggle between the nationalist movement against foreign domination, Shah gradually shifted towards the foreign powers. But the Shah was not strong enough to challenge Mossadegh directly. When he was stripped of his few remaining powers, he even offered to leave the country. Iranians refer to the Shah as the suitcase monarch. That is to say, he always had his bags packed. He was ready to go. All through his life, he would not stand against uh, strong uh, 
pressure. When there was no pressure, he was a very strong-willed uh, man, but as soon as there was a bit of adversity, he, w he would tend to bend. But in Washington, President Eisenhower had become convinced that Mossadegh was about to deliver Iran to the communists. With the active encouragement of the British, he decided to play the Shah card. A plan was drawn up by the CIA and by MI6. The Shah would dismiss Mossadegh while a mob, funded by the British and the Americans, took to the streets to neutralize Mossadegh's supporters. But the so-called counter-coup misfired. Mossadegh's supporters flooded onto the streets and the Shah's supporters went underground. The Shah fled to Rome with Queen Soraya. He appeared to have lost everything, but Mossadegh's victory was to be short-lived. Two days later, pro-monarchy demonstrators, backed by army units loyal to the Shah, took over the streets of Tehran. Some of the crowd had secret service dollars in their pockets, but many were genuine supporters of the monarchy. Mossadegh went into hiding, but was soon captured put on trial and placed under house arrest. The stay of the Shah of Persia and Queen Soraya in Rome was of short duration. For first reports of Dr. Mossadegh having won a victory were quickly reversed and from the turmoil of Tehran, news came that the royalist coup had been successful after all. For the Shah, 1953 marked a fresh start. The counter coup had shown that the West was prepared to back him but he was now also convinced that the Iranian people loved him. In a broadcast to the nation, he said, until now, I was a hereditary king, but now I am an elected one. You have elected me. But 1953 left a bitter legacy. The military coup of 1953 was actually a turning point, because for the first time in a third world country like in Iran, we tried to establish a democracy. And it was Shah and his foreign supporters who killed the democracy in Iran. That was the end of his legitimacy. The Shah's legitimacy was also undermined when the CIA began claiming the whole credit for the counter coup, suggesting it was their dollars rather than the Shah's popularity that had brought the people out on the streets. After 1953, America became a major player in Iran, pouring in aid and military advisors and helping to set up a secret police known as Savak. The thing to do was to help him stay in power and see to it that he stayed in power. There was no sense in going through this whole exercise and then having it failed in that fashion. But the Shah had no intention of failing. Dismissing independent-minded politicians and surrounding himself with compliant ministers and technocrats he was at last able to start running the country in a way his father would have recognized. When he come back and he see the love of the people, he felt that now he has to emerge as a strong man and he has to come as a leader, whether uh, people like it or not. Since the people love him, he has a duty for them. The new start was symbolized by a new queen. Though the Shah was deeply in love with Soraya, they were unable to have children. The question of the succession again became urgent. Reluctantly, the Shah agreed to take another wife. The couple were divorced in 1958, and the following year, there was a third royal wedding in Tehran. Farah Diba was part of a new generation of Western-educated Iranians. An art student in Paris, she brought a cultured, liberal influence to bear on her husband. It was to prove an immensely successful royal marriage, giving a boost to the Shah's image as a modern-minded monarch, injecting fresh thinking into the court and supplying the vital heir to the throne, Crown Prince Reza, born to great popular acclaim in 1960. When I got married, I was 21. Of course, in those days, I never realized the scale of uh, work which was uh, waiting uh, for me and uh, you know slowly I became familiar with the problems 
But I was very optimistic because, uh, you know, we had the will and the possibility to make our dreams come true. Farah turned out to be a very hard-working queen, very interested in her job. At the same time, she provided the smiling side of the royal family while the Shah smiled less and less. In 1961, the Shah made his most audacious move. He launched a revolution. Called the White Revolution, it promised land reform, the emancipation of women, health and literacy programs, and Western-style modernization. By putting his revolution to a referendum and receiving, according to official figures, 95% of the vote, the Shah was able to claim that the people endorsed his vision of modernization. But it wasn't just the masses who backed the Shah. Western-educated liberals were also swept along by his modernizing zeal. He would say, you want to make a revolution? I am going to make that revolution because you are not capable of uh, performing it. So I'll do it. And uh, I am going to go very fast, very quick, and you have to run to catch me. That's why most of our generation believed in him. For the first time, I think, in Iranian history, people were hopeful that they can solve their problems. The country would, uh, not only the country, the individuals in, in, that, in the country could hope for a, for a uh, life of prosperity and, and success. Many people also hoped that the revolution would deliver what the nationalist movements of the 50s had not, democracy. But their democratic aspirations were to be frustrated. In order to implement his revolution as rapidly as possible, the Shah put aside the constitution and muzzled the press. The experiences of 1953 had convinced him that his country was not ready for democracy. The Shah believed that uh, politics is a diabolical invention of uh, uh, ambitious uh, individuals, greedy individuals who uh, are uniquely after their own uh, personal interests. I was thinking that once you have a society in which everybody has a PhD and everybody is vaccinated against demagoguery and uh, being duped by politicians, then you can have politics. But when, when will that moment come? There's no question that my father was led to a situation where he had to take a lot of functions well beyond his constitutional limitations into his own hand. My father at that time was placed in a circumstance when he wanted to get the job done and if it was not done by reason of other people either failing in their duties or not assuming the proper responsibilities, he had to take it on himself and, and be on top of it to make sure it's done. Like his father, the Shah encountered the most stubborn resistance from the Shiite clergy. And, like his father, the Shah dismissed these criticisms as the reactionary views of a medieval mindset. If you are unhappy that your country makes uh, progress, if you are unhappy that your country is saying goodbye to a feudalistic system, if you are unhappy that uh, half of the population of your country, the women, are emancipated, well, this I cannot help. The sharpest attacks on the Shah came from an obscure priest based in the holy city of Gom. Ruola Khomeini preached against the Shah's reforms claiming that the emancipation of women was against Islamic law and accusing the Shah of being a puppet of foreign powers. In June of 1963, Khomeini was arrested and serious rioting broke out in Tehran and in other parts of the country. The Shah hesitated. Unwilling to stain his white revolution with blood, he refused to call out the army. His prime minister had to take the responsibility. The army went into action and several hundred people died. The problem with the Shah really is that he didn't have the ability to be ruthless when he had to be ruthless, when he needed to exercise power to preserve his throne. He really couldn't do it. Order was restored 
and Khomeini was exiled to Najaf, a Shiite holy city in neighboring Iraq, where he continued to preach against the Shah. In particular, he attacked the presence of American nationals in Iran, who had been granted immunity from Iranian laws. Despite furious tirades from Najaf, by 1967, the Shah felt confident enough to hold his coronation. He had delayed the event for more than 25 years because, he said, there was no honor in being crowned a king of a poor country. By the late 60s, Iran could claim to be, if not rich, at least on its way, with oil prices steadily rising. The economic promises of the White Revolution appeared to be coming good. Like his father, the Shah crowned himself. He thought that he has reached the peak of his power. He had become the most successful of Iranian kings for several centuries. The economy was going uh, very well. Uh, Iran's prestige was high throughout uh, the world. So he thought that uh, he has arrived. And um, this was, in fact, the beginning uh, of the fall. The Shah's fall began among the ruins of Persepolis, the seat of Persia's ancient Achaemenid kings, Darius and Xerxes. Iranian scholars close to the Shah suggested that the 2500th anniversary of the Achaemenid Empire be marked in some way. The idea had great appeal for the Shah. He could draw the world's attention to his own achievements and assert his own legitimacy by linking the Pahlavi regime with Iran's most ancient royal house. But most of all, the idea appealed to the Shah's mystic side. He felt a bond between himself and the first Achaemenid king, Cyrus the Great, whose simple tomb was at Pasagrad, near to Persepolis. The celebrations began on the 15th of October, 1971. In a voice charged with emotion, the Shah addressed the spirit of the long-dead king. O Cyrus, great king, king of kings, Achaemenian king, king of the land of Iran, I, the Shah and Shah of Iran, offer these salutations from myself and from my nation. For him, this moment was the essence of what he called the great civilization. He wanted to go into history as a new Cyrus. The great civilization for him was a combination of Cyrus the Great and of economic and social development. After honoring the memory of Cyrus, the Shah was joined by 50 heads of state for the main event, a parade of Iranian armies through the ages which out-demilled Cecil B. DeMille. But there was one group excluded from the events of Persepolis, the Iranian people. Because of security concerns and the inaccessibility of the site, most Iranians had to watch this patriotic pageant on television. Far from inspiring them with royalist fervor, it left many feeling baffled and insulted. Everything was ripe to start a real democratization of the society. And instead of that, he wanted to make a show of, of himself. 
And this is where uh, parting between him and the people starts. He felt bonded to and at one with Cyrus, the ancient Achaemenid monarchy, the whole grand history of Iran, and its cultural achievements. But this was some kind of mystical association which the Iranian people weren't plugged into. They didn't know what he was doing. The Shah's guests were ferried around in luxury coaches, unaware of the security measures surrounding the event. Fearful of terrorism or merely protest, Savak had rounded up thousands of people, loosely defined as troublemakers. Because of the security, because we have to look after every heads of states or representative of that country, the security arrested a lot of people. They put them in prison. And I went to His Majesty, I said, they have arrested a lot of people who are innocent. Persepolis had focused the attention of the world on Iran, but not in the way the Shah had hoped. After the event, human rights groups were flooded with lists of prisoners' names. They began to investigate and publicize claims of the detention, torture, and execution of political prisoners in Iran. <laughs> زندان یه سری وحشتناکی بود من یه سری میگم شما یه سری میشنوید اصلا طرز برخوردشون صحبتشون خیلی با ما وحشیانه و سخت بود یکی دو بار انسان رو مثلا با پا 6 ساعت آویزون میکردن دو ساعت آویزون میکردن که اصلا انسان فکر میکرد که همه دنیا الان داره مغزش رو متلاشی میکنه an international campaign began which was to blacken the shah's reputation he used to say to me very often, why is it that I get such a rotten press in Britain and Iraq does not? Uh, Saddam's Iraq. I used to say, and I still believe this, you get this bad press, Your Majesty, because you expect to be treated as one of us, as part of the Western world, whereas we don't treat Iraq as part of the Western world. The Shah was baffled by the attacks, for at the same time as some in the West portrayed him as an oppressive dictator, Western leaders were urging him to spend billions to become the policeman of the Gulf. The Shah could never understand how he could be the object of both bitter vilification and sycophantic praise. But if he was hurt by the Western media, he had his revenge. Oil. Convinced that the West had been getting cheap oil for too long, he worked within OPEC to raise prices. In 1973, oil prices quadrupled, and it was the Shah himself who in December of that year announced the latest rise. The Shah came to be seen as one of the West's chief tormentors, apparently taking particular delight in humiliating the British. If you continue this way, a permissive and disciplined society, you are going to blow up. Uh, you work not enough, you try to get too much money for the little work that you are putting up, and this cannot continue. It can continue for a few months, maybe one or two years, but not forever. When he got a situation in hand where he had the whip hand, I can't say that he didn't enjoy that to a certain extent. After all, he felt that uh, all through the years that he'd uh, been Shah, that uh, he'd had a pretty rough time. And finally the day had come when he was had some assets. And uh, I think anybody in his position would have enjoyed that. And he certainly did. I always thought at some point our country was in a way that it was too good to be true. We were a country with, we had history, we had civilization, we had natural wealth, we had human wealth, which is so important. We had the security, we had the stability, so everything was happening in Iran. There was a bright future in front of us. By the mid-70s, the Shah had all the levers of power firmly in his grasp. Government was a mere instrument of his will, and all power emanated from the throne. The Shah was the only game in town. He was the fount of all power. He was the fount of all 
uh, patronage. If you were in disfavor with the Shah, of course you could go and eke out an existence for yourself. But you really have to seriously limit your ambitions. For the people of Iran, political life was a charade. There were two parties, nicknamed the Yes Party and the Yes Sir Party. These were ultimately replaced by a single party, known as the King's Party. ببینید مشکل این نوع نظام ها همینه که خودشون افراد به اینجا میکشونن که یا باید صد درصد موافقشون بشید یا مخالفشون خودش راهی نمیذاش که کسی اگر چیزی مثبتی هم ازش ببینه تایید کنه خودش اینطوری میخواست By the mid 70s the Shah had achieved an international standing far greater than anything his father could have dreamed of the suitcase monarch of the 1950s was unrecognizable in the emperor of oil. I think we were, to some extent, bedazzled by the superficial appearance of the Shah's control. Uh, some of us, like myself, who had known of him back in the early 1950s, found it difficult to swallow the fact that he was a completely changed person. Others took it for granted that he was what he appeared to be. Strong, forceful, formidable, all-knowing, all-wise, totally in control. And this was the picture he presented to the world. I think in a sense we all accepted this, although some of us accepted it with greater reluctance than others. We particularly welcome you and the Empress as good friends and old friends. But even at the height of his power, the Shah remained an enigmatic leader. His imperious demeanor was often belied by diffidence, even shyness. I am deeply honored, Mr. President, to be once again your guest. He was the reverse of a charismatic man. He was a hopeless public speaker, wooden, boring. Put him in front of a crowd, his instinct was to withdraw. He was an introverted, really shy man. I think he actually um, was basically a rather timid man behind that um, facade of imperial grandeur. Because of this timidity, he was as much a victim as a maker of his own image. The biggest secret hidden behind the imperial facade was the fact that since 1974, the Shah had been undergoing treatment for cancer. The Shah did not admit to having cancer while he was on the throne. If everybody had known that he was, had cancer, they would have understood what this real hurry was to shove the country into a, a more of a 20th century mode. Looking for a shortcut towards the great civilization, the Shah had decided to plow all the extra money from the oil boom directly into the economy. Overnight, the five-year plan was doubled. But after years of record growth, the country simply couldn't absorb any more investment. The benefits of Iran's economic miracle had always been unevenly spread. But when the miracle lost its potency, the massive inequalities between rich and poor were everywhere apparent. Economic insecurity and frustrated expectations encouraged many Iranians to look more closely at the so-called great civilization. Now that the glitter was wearing off, many were dismayed at what Iran had become. ولی شاید در از شاید بیش از حد به این قضیه به هادا در حالی که نکته که تو ایران خیلی مهم بود اینه که حتی قرب زده های قبلیمون نسبت به این قضیه بسیار حساس شدن یعنی احساس کردن که این گرایش به قبل دیگه هویتشون رو هم داره از دست میده It became fashionable to talk about West toxification and it was understood that no one was more toxified than the Shah himself his interests and his lifestyle all seem to indicate a ruler who thought Western culture superior to Iranian. His religious critics argued that he was simply unsuited to be the king of a Muslim country. But as I say, the law of the law of the law of the law was that the 
که پاستار تشیع باشه و عامل نشر تشیع باشه خب شما تصور کنید یک کسی که از نظر قانون پاستار یک فرهنگیه تمام زندگیش بر ضد اون فرهنگ باشه چگونه میشه اینا رو مردم میدیدند جرأت حرف زدن نداشتن ولی جرأت فکر کردن و فهمیدن رو داشتن But while religious leaders wanted a return to tradition some Iranians very often the children of the Shah's revolution wanted democracy and even an end to monarchy When you talk about Iran then it was a country that was shifting gears a great part of the country with traditional views uh, they had a, a little bit of a problem adjusting to the rapid pace of change and on the other hand you had intellectuals who were in fact demanding faster reforms and i guess at some point in time we had a sort of crisis not purely political but a sort of social sociological crisis that began in my country Celebrations in 1976 marking the 50th anniversary of the Pahlavi regime were a somber affair. The dutiful applause of the well-drilled audience gathered at the tomb of Reza Shah had a hollow ring. An atmosphere of stagnation was gripping the country, but the Shah still believed that the people supported him. I can claim to have the pulse of my people really in my hand. and we have shown to each other so many times signs of complete devotion to each other that there is a very special situation today in my country in january 1977 jimmy carter took the oath of office on the white house lawn elected on a platform of human rights and the reduction of arms sales carter appeared to be the shah's worst nightmare the office of president of the united states and will in fact carter quickly accepted that there was simply no alternative to the shah all he could do was to encourage the limited liberalization program that the shah had introduced the previous year of the united states so help me god so help me god neither side appreciated that this liberalization would act as a catalyst in a country ripe for revolution in the dying days of 1977 Jimmy Carter paid a visit to the Shah in Tehran. Conscious of the need to signal his support, Carter made a fulsome New Year's toast. Tehran, because of the great leadership of the Shah, is an island of stability in one of the more troubled areas of the world. A few days after Carter left, a spark was struck that was to start the revolution. Ayatollah Khomeini had been a thorn in the Shah's side for 14 years. Recently, however, he had started calling for the overthrow of the monarchy. Reassured by Carter's unconditional support, the Shah decided to retaliate. There was an article prepared by the Shah's press office, and uh, the Shah had a direct hand in it because he was furious about Khomeini, what he had been saying about him. so he wanted to answer uh, and he had this habit to answer any any insult any criticism whatever the source uh, so he ordered the preparation and writing of this article and uh, they gave it to me uh, to be published in one of the newspapers it was a routine matter the article accused homeni of licentious behavior and of being a british agent It provoked demonstrations from his followers in the holy city of Gom. The authorities reacted and a number of people were killed. The deaths in Gom triggered a recurring cycle of often bloody demonstrations. Secular opposition groups rallied to Khomeini's banner and within weeks unrest had spread throughout the country. all the things that had uh, not happened in Iran over 15 years suddenly happened in 15 days we had had absolutely no strike strikes suddenly everybody was on strike we had had absolutely no demonstration suddenly everybody was demonstrating nobody had seen any crowds in Iran suddenly there were crowds in the streets and nobody could uh, estimate their size 
we all failed to predict the revolution. We identified all the areas of discontent and opposition. But since they were all opposed for a different reason, it was very difficult to see how they could actually coalesce, run together. The true leader of the Iranian revolution in negative way is the Shah. He did everything wrong to unite all different factions together. He just couldn't believe that he was as unpopular as he turned out to be. Uh, that there was no such thing as the Shah people revolution. That he hadn't formed a bond with the people. That they weren't grateful to him for all the changes that had taken place in Iran. That he really was that popular. And that of all things, black reaction was leading the people against him. He would have been happier if it had been Re Red Revolution. He would have been happier if it had been the communists, because at least he felt that they were progressive, whereas the people he rarely had it in for were the mullahs. I don't say we didn't have shortcomings and problems, but it didn't deserve such a horrible revolution. People, uh, really many of them had become hysterical. There was the only thing they wanted for the regime to change. And of course, everything started not immediately uh, as a snowball. And unfortunately, the evil forces were stronger than we were. The turning point in the revolution occurred on a Friday afternoon in early September. Martial law had been declared in Tehran but despite this, many people were determined to join a demonstration in Jale Square. The crowds found the route to Jale Square blocked by troops. As their numbers increased, they pressed forward and the troops opened fire. It was said later that the Shah himself had been flying above the crowd in a helicopter directing operations. But the bloody shambles of Black Friday was unplanned. This was not a, a cold-blooded attempt to, to kill large numbers of people. This was groups of untrained recruits who were shooting wildly in, in, into the crowd. It was very random shooting. Uh, nobody ever will know how many people died that day, but it was an extraordinarily bloody scene. Um, the authorities put the numbers in, in the low 20s or, or 30s of fatalities. But in reality, I think it probably ran into a couple of hundred. When I saw the Shah shortly afterwards, he was absolutely horrified by what was happening. It was the first time I'd really felt that he saw that a situation was arising which he couldn't handle. He was saying over and over again that um, a dictator could kill his people, but a king could not. Despite all the expectations and the urging of hardliners among his advisers, the Shah refused to order the systematic use of maximum force. We were expecting more blood than what did actually took place. Relatively speaking, comparing to the, what happened in the French Revolution, Iranian Revolution was not bloody. For those observing from outside Iran, this hesitation was puzzling, even frustrating. People were saying, when's he going to do it? And he never did. It was very clear to all of us who were watching Iran at that time that the Shah wanted us to take responsibility for this. He wanted a clear order sent from Washington that said, crack down on these people, kill people if you have to, but re-establish re order and stability. And Washington simply refused to do that. We simply were not going to put ourselves in that position. He clearly wanted us to. But some feel that the Shah's hesitation belies his popular image as a ruthless dictator. 
after 20 years of thinking about modernization, one of the things which changes in your mind is the question of blood. The Shah didn't want to go into history as a bloody uh, dictator. If he had a ruthless side to him, I never had the opportunity to come across that. To me, he was the opposite. But you know, worse than being a dictator is to create a perception that you are one. In November, the Shah appealed to the nation, claiming that he understood and even sympathized with the revolution. Two days later, he authorized the arrest of many of his former ministers and advisors. The man in charge of Savak at the time had prepared a list of 500, 500 top officials of the past 20 years and wanted to, to arrest them to give satisfaction to popular mood. And in two or three, in, in three waves, I was arrested in the second wave. Some 70, 80 people were arrested, all staunch supporters of, of the regime. And uh, several thousand were released from prisons, all uh, <laughs> blood enemies of, of the regime. It was really a perverse situation. My brother was uh, dismissed from uh, his job and uh, put under uh, arrest. Many people, both from Iran and from outside Iran, told me the day he did that, told me the Shah is finished. Because uh, when a leader tries to avoid responsibility, he's not anymore a leader. The Shah, who demanded loyalty from everyone, uh, was incapable of reciprocating it. And um, Oveda was... Um, thrown uh, to the wolves to divert the pack. And I think this was a monstrous gesture on the part of the Shah. As the court fell out, the crowds on the streets swelled to unbelievable proportions. On the feasts of Tasua and Ashura, the holiest dates in the Shiite calendar. Crowds in Tehran are estimated to have reached one and a half million. On January the 16th, 1979, the Shah and Queen Farah left Niavaran Palace for the last time and headed for the airport. husband left because he realized that if really people have been so much convinced that uh, they are going to have a better life with another system or a religious millennium has to occur, there was nothing he could do about it. Like his father before him, the Shah was to die in exile. He wanted to settle in America or Britain, but his former allies did not dare offer him a home. He became an international nomad looking for a refuge, and all the time his cancer was getting worse. He ended up in Panama, where he gave his last full-scale interview. You think that Mr. Khomeini, uneducated, 
uh, person, he could have planned all this, masterminded all this, set up all the organization. I know that one man alone could not have done it. This I know. He was contemptuous of Khomeini's people. He couldn't believe that they could have done this themselves. He certainly didn't believe that you know, his people had lost faith in him. You know, this was a terrible thing for him to admit. Um, and he wasn't not prepared to do that. Threatened with extradition to Iran, the Shah left Panama for Egypt in March 1918. By then he had seen the return of Ayatollah Khomeini and the rapid capitulation of his army. As he lay dying in a hospital in Cairo, his father's mausoleum in Tehran was demolished. On the ruins of the Shah's great civilization, there now stood an Islamic Republic. He never complained. As if he has uh, reached a level of wisdom and uh, life that he was flying over the pettiness of life and uh, treasons and uh, injustices. And uh, although he was really terribly, I mean, his heart was bleeding for what was happening in Iran, and times also questioning himself why, but he never complained. He died on the 27th of July, 1980. President Sadat gave him a state funeral, but few of his former allies attended. Radio Tehran announced his death with the words, the bloodsucker of the century is dead. He was a powerful nationalist. He was in his way a revolutionary. He set about modernizing what was, in developmental terms, one of the most backward countries in the whole Middle East. And he got an awful long way down that road. He lost the race, but an awful lot of what he created is bound to survive. His greatest sin will be seen as this attempt to actually turn the people of Iran into something that they were not. He was trying to turn them into copies of Europeans and Americans. They did not want to be turned into something different. They are very traditional people. So they turned ultimately to their traditional leaders, the religious classes, in order to prevent this transformation which the Shah was trying to bring about. To me, it's a great tragedy that this man with such high hopes and, in a sense, with such um, valid ambitions for his people, that he should have become so blinded to what was happening in his own country. To become so much the prisoner, really, of a personality for himself, which he and his sycophants had created over the previous 25 years or so, that he came to such a tragic end. I am dedicated to my country because this is the most beautiful thing that could happen. What could I take away with me when I go in the grave? Not even uh, a dress, maybe just a piece of white cloth, that's all. So what I've got to take with me in the grave is history. <laughs> 